to trick or some ring. So tonight, um, the main body of what we're going to be doing is going through some verses of this text. So uh, I'll give an introduction to this text. We started this text about a year ago, so uh, I'll try to get you up to speed in a few minutes. But um, first, no problem. Um, so, is both of you your first time here? No, you? Second? Okay. I see, okay, great. Your first time. You I haven't seen in months. Couple of weeks, I was traveling. Yeah. Feels like months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we start with a little bit of, um, just a little bit of um, breathing meditation. So please get into a comfortable meditation posture <clears throat> and try to maintain a uh, you know, straight back. So finding that balance between discipline and relaxation. So at, you know, uh, at home or throughout your day even, um, you can just take a few minutes to connect with your body, connect with your breath, calm down the mind. So if you're short on time, you can just start with a few uh, you know, kind of forceful exhalations. So exhale and expel all of the air that's in your lungs. Think that as you exhale, all of your negative emotions, negative thoughts, as well as illness, uh, any kind of obstacles that we're facing, think that as you exhale, that comes out from <clears throat> your nostrils in the form of black smoke. Then breathe in naturally and then on the next exhalation, also a bit forceful. Think that that uh, smoke gets further away, rises off into the sky. Then with, with each subsequent breath, gets further and further away and then dissipates into the sky, leaving no trace. And get a sense that now your mind, your mental continuum is completely free of all those negative, disturbing emotions. to the natural breath as it is. So no longer trying to you know, have a forceful exhalation, but just go back to a natural rhythm of breathing. And then as we inhale, you can put your mind's attention on the rising of the abdomen. As we exhale, then the abdomen will fall and will contract. So just place your awareness there on the belly, on the stomach. And here again, we're working with just the natural breath as it is not having preference for a long breath or a short breath, but rather just trying to become aware of how we are breathing in the present moment. <clears throat>
and try to pay special attention to the split second when the in-breath becomes the out-breath and so on. The out-breath becoming the in-breath. while we're trying to focus on the breath. If other appearances occur in the mind, whether they be external, like sounds, or internal, like thoughts bubbling up, we don't engage with them. We can be aware that they arise, but if we don't engage, then we might notice that they pass away in the very next second.
so gently come out of meditation and bring your awareness back to the room. Okay, so everyone, um, are you clear about the instructions for that meditation? You know at least what we're trying to do. Yes? Great. Mm. So yesterday we had a, a session, a kind of new series that I want to start. Essential daily practice. Yeah. Because oftentimes we have a lot of more philosophical lectures, and then not everyone is so philosophically inclined. Even if they are philosophically inclined, they question how to integrate all this into daily life. The glasses are flopping up. So, um, yesterday was intended to give kind of morning routine for our practice. Um, and so the foundation or the, the kind of start of that is to do just a few minutes of this breathing meditation. Um, right when you wake up in the morning, before your day gets going, the mind is relatively calm, I hope. And then uh, you can just kind of wake up rather than hitting the snooze button, you can get up and do this meditation for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, so, the other thing that sometimes people have um, not so clear view on is then how this meditation will then help them in their real life. Okay? So I'm going to make that connection explicit. Okay. This type of mindfulness meditation that we're doing, that we're trying to learn, we're building a skill. Yeah. This skill is, okay, so in the meditation, we're trying to focus on the breath, but as we're doing that, other things appear to the mind, especially here. While we're not in the meditation retreat center in the Himalayas, we're in the city. So you hear the rickshaws, you hear the, the dishes clanging, you know? Um, and even if we had perfect silence, if your mind is anything like mine, even with no external distraction, then the mind is thinking this and that. Mind's, uh, the mind is, you know, they call it the monkey mind. You know, you heard of the monkey mind? Hmm? Monkey mind, you've heard of it? Do you have it? Yes, I have it. Um, so, you know, you understand the monkey mind? What a, taking away my job. Okay, for the sake of the people on the YouTube, the monkey mind is so called like, just when you have a monkey, you know, it just jumps from branch to branch or tree to tree. Yes? Then our mind is like that. It's never just in one place but it's constantly jumping from different thought to thought. Yeah? In a very uncontrolled way. So, this internal type of distraction, or the external type of distraction, we are, in this meditation, we don't chase after the thoughts. You know, we don't add to the mental chatter. But we just are aware of it, and then, uh, like, don't engage, and therefore let go, okay? So as we do this on our meditation cushion, we're building up a skill that we can then use in our real life. Because, uh, I don't know, if you're like me, what we encounter is not according to what we want to encounter, right? We meet someone, or, you know, traffic, or 
someone says something we don't like, we encounter some kind of, you know, um, provocative situation, okay? And it's not just bad enough that we encounter those situations, but what happens is we then dwell on it, you know, for the rest of the day. Someone said something that wasn't very nice in the morning, you know, and then we're thinking about it. Even days later, weeks later, years later, we dwell on it. Shibira, this happened to you? Huh? Okay. So, this skill, okay, of being able to, rather than, oh, she said that to me, and then keep thinking, and this, and then this, and then this, and then this, you know? Playing it over and over again, what happens? We're just creating more suffering for ourselves. Yeah? So, in the meditation session, a thought comes up, we notice there's a thought, but then we say, okay, I'm not going to engage. I stay on my breath. Okay? Then, in real life, real life, whatever that means, something else appears to the mind. We then have the ability not to engage and then just live life on our own terms. Okay? So that's the important thing. You understand? Counting to, to whatever, 21 breaths or whatever, you know, that's actually not, that's just a means to an end, right? This is like, um, some of your exercise, right? Um, I don't know, whatever you want to do. Push-ups. The point isn't to do push-ups, but the, the point is to train certain muscle groups, you know, stimulate them in a certain way that they then respond to that stimulus, and then you get stronger, you know, and then you can do other things that you want to do, like swing a golf club. Okay? So then, as we're trying to build this skill, then it's the same thing with anything else, anything else we're trying to do. We start off slowly, we start off in a small way. So even what we're doing today, five minutes of meditation, great. You know, do that, but do that every day. And then you can gradually add six minutes, seven minutes, and then, you know, at a certain point, you know, uh, half hour, hour, four hours, whatever you want to do. Yeah? Okay. So that was the first thing we talked about yesterday. Trying to just build a daily meditation practice, core meditation practice. But this one, is training, uh, well, two, two major skills. One is the skill of letting go, and then the second one is the skill of trying to get mental stability. Because as we get more proficient in not chasing after the thoughts, what will happen is those thoughts will bubble up less frequently. You know? And then we can have you know, a greater amount of mental stability Concentration, focus. Hmm? But, as great as that is, if we then have just our concentration and focus on the breath, well, see, the breath is a good meditation object from a few standpoints. One is, Everyone breathes, right? right? So, where everyone is in touch with the breath. There's other meditations when you, you know, visualize the Buddha in the space in front of you, but not everyone knows what the Buddha looks like. Not everyone is a Buddha. It's not everyone feel comfortable visualizing a Buddha, you know, lights radiating, you know. Also, some people, although, there are other types of mantra meditations and so forth. 
some people are like, you know, what are we doing with all these, you know, funny uh, incantations, right? So the breath, meditating on the breath, takes a lot of that kind of mumbo jumbo out of it. Yeah? It's relatively easy to focus on because we're doing it all the time. Yeah? But, so th that's on the good side. Yeah? And as we focus on the breath, because while we say we're focusing on the breath, we're actually focusing on the rising and falling of the abdomen, it means some sensations in the body. And so normally, when we think, we're thinking about things that might happen in the future or things that happened in the past. But the sensations that are going on, it's only in the present moment. So as we can attune ourselves to the breath, we're then dropping the discursive thoughts and we're then back in the present. Yeah? So they say the breath is the best meditation object for those who have a high amount of discursiveness. Discursive? Okay. Mm. Yeah, discursive is like, you know, just wandering type thoughts, not related to anything. Okay? You know? So, um, that meditation object, the breath, is, is, is uh, recommended in the traditional texts to be best for those with discursive, a problem with discursiveness. Okay? Wandering mind. Monkey mind. Okay? Mm. But, we can't just leave it at that. You know? Actually, um, the breath in and of itself is, is a neutral object. It means neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. Right? So what we actually have to do is transform our mind to virtue, okay? So normally, if our mind is in a non-virtuous state, we have to first go to neutral, and then we can take it to virtue, okay? Um, so the other reason why we have this meditation at the beginning of our session is we put our mind in a nice neutral state, then from there, we can take it to virtue, okay? So then the rest of what we were talking about yesterday in the uh, you know, essential daily practice was then to, um, you know, how to then transform our minds into virtue, okay? And so, uh, you should all have this in front of you, okay? I'm just gonna, we started it yesterday. I'm gonna go a little bit more today um, but then we're going to get to the main um, text that we have been going through, Bodhisattva uh, Charitara. Okay? Alright. <clears throat> yes, girls? Which page is I'm not on the page yet. I'm on the cover. Okay? I'm on the cover. Because what was I just saying? We start with neutral, then we have to transform into virtue. Okay? So then this text is about how we transform our mind into virtue. So then, that actually is another way, this title is another way of saying it. The method to, to transform a suffering life into happiness, including enlightenment. Okay? Now, how? Okay? So one key concept within uh, Buddhist thought is this, uh, the concept of cause and effect, right? If you want to have certain effects, you have to uh, accumulate the causes of it, okay? So then, suffering, happiness, enlightenment all arise from certain causes and conditions, okay? So, if you want those effects, you need to accumulate the causes. If you don't want other types of effects, you have to abandon their causes. Okay? So we don't want suffering. Right? So then we need to abandon the causes of suffering. We want happiness. 
They have a four wheeling two accumulated cause of happiness. And, by the way, we want the best type of happiness there is, so then, which is enlightenment, so then we need to like, achieve the, the best type of, you know, accumulation of causes of happiness. Okay? Mm. So, the method to transform a suffering life into happiness, see, those causes of happiness and suffering, you know, are fundamentally rooted in our minds, and in particular, the motivation we have to perform, you know, our, our actions, you know, action, karma is action, right? So another, you know, key concept within Buddhism, not just cause and effect, but this thought of karma, that from virtuous actions arise happy, happy results, and from suffering actions, sorry, non-virtuous actions arise suffering results. Okay? And since what determines whether an action is virtuous or not virtuous is the motivation with which we undertake it, right? In general, motivation of uh, virtuous thought, like compassion, right? We see someone suffering, we, you know, then try to do something to alleviate their suffering, that's virtue, right? Virtuous motivation, virtuous action, happy result. Yeah, <clears throat> or the uh, flip side, non-virtuous mind of anger then propels us to do a non-virtuous uh, action of harming someone, and then that will lead to a suffering result. Okay? Mm. So, then the method to transform a suffering life into happiness actually then means to transform the motivation with which we undertake our actions. Okay? Alright. <clears throat> so I said this yesterday. But I'm just gonna very briefly. Yeah. Believe me, you haven't met me before, but this is very brief for me, isn't it? You know, I could have said that in an hour, uh, like two hours, what I just said, but I got through in 15 minutes, or oh, 20 minutes, 19 minutes. <clears throat> so let's turn to page eight. They have the new um, pagination. Not all. It's okay. half and half. Okay. Just to keep you on your toes, it's either page six or page eight. Okay? So there'll be, uh, in, in the second paragraph, this, this paragraph that starts with, please bless me to see that this greatly meaningful body with freedom and richnesses. Are you there? Okay, so just keep the, the, the book open to that page, but put it down and listen to it. Okay. All right. So, in general, our mm, mm, let me say this uh, because it'll be a, a segue into the text that we're talking about later. This Bodhisattva Charitata. So, in this, uh, the great Indian Master Shantideva says, you know, although you know, living beings uh, want happiness. Um, they ignorantly destroy the causes of happiness like an enemy. And although living beings uh, don't want suffering, they, it's like they run after the causes of suffering. Yeah? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yesterday, but I'll say it again today. Then Nagarjuna said in the Mula Manjamika 
that um, infused by great compassion, you taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views to go down through that posture, right? So, um, just very briefly, compassion is the wish that others be free from suffering. Yeah, the Buddha has been motivated by compassion in all of his deeds. He wants any beings to be free from suffering. But merely wishing them to be free from suffering isn't enough. He went on and then inquired into why living beings are suffering. And then saw, you know, just like what Shani Deva was saying, actually the fundamental confusion that we have is we, th we are confused about the cause of suffering and the cause of happiness. We want happiness, but it's like, we destroy the cause of happiness with our own non-virtuous actions. We don't want suffering, but we keep accumulating the causes of suffering. You know? So, fundamentally, you know, the, the Buddha, enthused by great compassion, doesn't want us to suffer anymore, then talk the Dharma so we can overcome these wrong views, this confusion we have. You know? And so then, the Buddha taught, you know, um, and the Buddha taught the, the, the methods to then, you know, transform our minds, to transform our non-virtuous motivations, our disturbing emotions, our uh, klesha, as they call it, disturbing thoughts like anger, pride, jealousy, so forth, to lessen them to the point where we can abandon them totally leaving not even the possibility for them to arise again in our mental continuum. And then our kind of good minds, like compassion, patience, generosity, you know, wisdom, how to then increase those minds to their fullest extent. And, and by the way, that's what enlightenment is, those two things together. The complete abandonment of all faults of the mind and the complete development of all good qualities. That's what enlightenment is. Okay. So then the, the Buddha taught those very techniques uh, for us to transform our minds in that way. But it's now up to us to actually do the work. You know, uh, there's a lot of medical analogies, right? But the, they liken the Buddha to a doctor, right? So the doctor can diagnose, hmm? can, can tell us what ails us and the, the, uh, the cause of that ailment, and can also prescribe a certain course of treatment but the actual thing that will cure us, <clears throat> the medicine, that's what the Dharma is likened to, the Dharma. And, um, well, I think Shantideva says, you know, like, just like a, a, a leper, you know, whose limbs are falling off, they're not gonna get cured by taking you know, one dose of medicine, right? Yeah. So similarly, ourselves, who've been afflicted with, you know, the negative emotions for, you know, countless, countless lives, we're not going to get, uh, you know, cured just by, you know, one weekend course. So they say that, you know, the Dharma is the medicine, but our continued practice is the way to recovery. Okay? So, in any case, um, keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, so I'm just giving a little, this, this is how it turns to hours. I give little asides like this.
So just keep it um, keep it in mind that what we're trying to do, you know, is going to take a long time of continuous effort, you know? and it is not always obvious the progress that we're making, and especially if we look in too uh, you know short a time frame, it's kind of like this. I don't know if um, uh, this happens, right? But like you know, you see someone after some months, you know, and they say, oh, you lost weight, <laughs> or oh my gosh, you gained weight, yeah. Is this a conversation? What? Is this a conversation, Vanderbilt? People have to say something to, so they talk about their weight. No, 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 you're missing my point, no, no. Yes. No, no, no. Change is so gradual, Sector. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. When you just look, you know, day to day, you can't tell, right? You can't tell if you've gained or lost weight. But only after like a month, you know, or something, then it becomes apparent. That's not the point I'm trying to make. Sorry, man. Huh? No, I mean, of course. It's okay. Actually, there's someone who normally comes here who every time I come says I've lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> and you must say, oh, no, you're, you're not eating enough. You're not eating enough. And, and unfortunately, it's not true at all. I bought a scale. I'm tracking my weight on, on Fitbit. Oh my gosh. So, this is what I'm saying. So, in a similar way, right, when we're uh, trying to engage in our uh, spiritual development, our development of the mind, day to day, it's very hard to see any kind of progress. You know? And, you know, one day we might get angry. We didn't get angry for like, oh, yeah, two weeks, three weeks. You know? But then we come to Bangalore and we meet the rickshaw drivers again. <laughs> That's, you know, um, the Buddha, the night before he was enlightened, you know, he, he stayed under the Bodhi tree, right, in Bodhgaya, and then it said the Maras attacked him. But through the power of his love, all the Mars arrows, they turned into flowers. So I thought, oh, maybe, you know, because that was like kind of his final test, right? But I thought maybe, you know, today, in this day and age, then you know, the Buddha might come to, like, Bangalore and, like, deal with the auto drivers. I have some karma with that. Anyway. What was I saying? Oh, yes. So, we might notice this in our mind and then we can get, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not making any progress. I'm such a bad meditator. We can think that, that's bad. I mean, beating ourselves up. We shouldn't do that. Then even worse would be to then say, oh, all those techniques that Nam Jong was talking about, those don't work. That's also not so good. But then even worse, then we also blame Buddha, right? <laughs> and say, these ones, oh man, the Buddha taught that, they didn't work for me. Forget it. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the train of thought I was on. So what I was saying is then, you know, the Buddha taught these techniques to transform our mind. And he taught for, well, in this world, 
65 years after he was enlightened, until he passed away. And those teachings then formed 108 volumes of scripture. Hmm? Yes. You can, oh, you guys don't speak Tibetan. Anyway, you can download them all. You know? They're real. It's amazing. All, the, all those teachings of Buddha. All the early. Yeah. They're available in Tibetan. Uh, but even if you did speak Tibetan, uh, to understand, well, first to have the time to read 108 volumes. It's not, this, is, this is not a volume. <laughs> like, big 1,200 page, you know, volumes. It's a lot. <clears throat> um, just reading. Okay, so sometimes, okay, this is just some knowledge for you. There's a tradition of giving the, the so-called oral transmission. Have you heard of this? Oral transmission, or the loom of a certain text. And so, this is important um, because you, okay, these looms, oral transmissions, how it, how it would go is, let's say, you know, Shanideva or whatever, the Buddha, someone, they compose something, then they teach it. Okay? So then the, the author would, you know, read his work, then all of you then have that transmission from the original author. Okay? Then you, to your disciples, you would recite that work, and so on. And so, it's an unbroken lineage from, you know, Guru to Chela, from the time of Buddha up until now. The oral transmission of the Buddhist sutras still exists in the world. It's amazing. The what? The concept of Chinese whisper, like from one person. Chinese whisper. Oh. Concept, oh. Like, what do you say? Like, you know, is it the exact one, or there might be a change in the uh, concept of what Buddha has given to the authors, authors to the disciples. Good evening. Okay, yes, that, that's there. Okay, but, but, but okay, let, let, let's be practical first, and then I'll address. So nowadays, it's written. Okay? Now they're, they're put in down. Okay? So literally, when you, when you, and we're actually getting away from the point I was trying to make. Okay? But literally now, when you go to a oral transmission, the master would just read, like, very quickly, you know, like, the heart sutra, I, I've memorized, right, so, you know, like, quite quick like this, yeah? So, it's not that you're then listening and you're trying to take down the notes, but you just get it, you get the oral transmission, and then later when you give it, you have the text in front of you and you just read it, okay? So that... It's not um, broken. Now, the other point, before it was written down, um, could there be some uh, changes? Yes, it's possible. But um, you have to understand, I mean, how we talk about it is those great masters, like Ananda, the Buddha's disciple, had perfect memory. You know, and um, actually, even in more modern times, uh, yeah, there's some very 
prodigious masters who, in a text about this long, they could read it once and then recite from memory, word by word. You understand? I don't know. Yes, you in the back. Are you itching your hair or? No, no, no. Actually, I wanted to ask you. A Please. Mahapati Sutana. Huh? Is that what you're talking about? The word of uh, the the teaching of So that that's one sutra. A sutra, yeah. But there's what I'm saying. There's 108 volumes of sutra. Right, right. Okay. And uh, um, that is just one, which is actually just yeah. uh, 40 some pages, maybe. Yeah, okay. well, not what you said, yeah. I know about, but yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, hundred volumes, so those masters who are now giving the oral transmission, okay, they're reading quick. To just read all those hundred eight volumes, if they do it, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day, it takes about nine months. That's just that's just to, to read it, not even like to think about the meaning, but just literally to speak like in the as of like this. Okay. Now, so what I'm talking about here is, although the Buddha taught all those sutras to help us transform our minds, now our job to put those into practice, we now need to. You know, we ask for the, give me the, the essence, you know? Yeah. And so, this here, this um, first text in this booklet, right? The direct meditation on the graduated path con con containing all the important meanings is the distillation of the 108 volumes into <clears throat> two pages. Yeah. Amazing. But. Of all the volumes. Yeah. You mean the essence? The essence. Mm -hmm. Sorry, distillation. Yeah, sorry. Right? Hello, you can see this? So, this is very. You know, the, the, sometimes the, the Tibetan um, titles, they're very just, you know, exact. <laughs> they're, very, they're very precise. So this one, a direct meditation on the graduated path containing all the important meanings. Yes, that's what this is. They're not getting cute with marketing gimmicks, you know? Right? So, now, just flip the page to, um, please bless me to see, okay? So now, this distillation, okay, it's then further categorized into three uh, basic motivations that a, a Dharma practitioner can have for their practice. And this centers around three goals that they have, three things they want to achieve. And I guess the flip side of that is three things they want to avoid. Okay? Uh, so, the first one, okay, and now these three, they're called like the lower capable being, the middle capable being, the greater capable being, okay? So, this is as far as we got yesterday. <laughs> but the lower capable being, or the initial motivation with which we undertake our practice, is, look here, okay? Please bless me to see that this greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses is difficult to find and easily perishes. Action and result are so profound and that the sufferings of the evil gone transmigratory beings are so difficult to bear. 
Therefore, please bless me to take refuge from the depths of my heart and the three rare sublime ones to abandon negative karma and to accomplish virtue according to Dharma. Okay? So what is the most important thing with the greatest urgency that we have to do? Uh, well, yes. Abandon negative karma and accomplish virtue. Why? Because we're going to die. When we die, two ways our mental continuum can go. To a good rebirth, like a human, or Fluffy the cat. Okay, just, just, just hold on. So this is, this is the most urgent thing, because easily perishes, we can die at any time. So I'm talking urgency means we have to do it now. And since we can even die before we go home tonight, you know, that like they say in the, the, the text, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow's sunrise, what's going to happen first, tomorrow's sunrise, or our next rebirth. Yeah. So since we can even die sitting on this very cushion, the most urgency is to make sure that we get a good rebirth in our next life. Understand? Mm. So then how, how we then transform our mind to do that, what is our mind currently so entangled with? Happiness and pleasure of this life. You know, worldly concerns. Right? But compared to this life, we might be living another 20, 30, 40 years, maybe. Some of you young ones, maybe 50 years. But after this life, it's endless. So it's much more important. So we need to, to switch our level of concern from primarily being concerned with just this life and ignoring what's going to happen after our death to actually what happens in this life doesn't matter so much, you know? It's like the waiting room. But what, where I go after this life is so much more important. Okay? And how do we do that? By this. This opportunity I have with a hu as a human body is so precious, so greatly meaningful, difficult to find, easily perishes, cause and effect, oh my gosh, you know, all these things, that's the main thing that the, the initial spiritual practitioner thinks about. And therefore, what do they practice? They then abandon negative karma and accomplish virtue according to Dharma. Okay. That's it. Now, next. Independence upon that, if, even if I achieve a mere higher rebirth of a devil or human, Right? Which is, by the way, what you would achieve if you are successful in the initial practices of uh, abandoning virtue, abandoning non-virtue. This is the story of my life. Okay? Uh, okay. I will still have to experience the suffering endlessly in samsara because of not having abandoned and being under the control of the disturbing thought obscurations. Therefore, please bless me to reflect well upon the way of circling in samsara and to continuously follow day and night the path of the three types of precious trains, the principal method for becoming free from samsara. Okay? So this is now what you were talking about. Right? Yes, we're successful, we get a good rebirth in our next life. But, even if you achieve that, you still have to experience suffering endlessly within samsara. So what is samsara? Some technical terminology. We've all heard of it. Cycle of existence. But what that means, hmm? Be more precise. Human condition. Continuous recycling. Yes. Conditions that we live in, this body. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But to be very more precise, The cycle of uncontrolled rebirth, we don't, we don't choose, but rather it's propelled by, you see, because of not having abandoned and being under the control of the disturbing thought obscurations. 
That's what klesha, klesha is. Yeah? Anger, attachment, all these disturbing emotions, you know? We don't have any choice where we were born, nor do we even have choice uh, when we get sick, um, what happens to us, you know, we have very little choice. We're in the, under the power of, under the control of the disturbing thought obscurations, okay? So, that's what samsara is, uncontrolled cycle of rebirth, due to karma and afflictions, okay? So, even the rebirth as a human, as we are now, we're still in samsara. How that, how we got to be reborn as a human is we did practice the initial, uh, the lower capable of being in our past life. We practiced virtue, but we weren't free from the disturbing thought obscurations, right? So we had a thought, okay, you know, for example, uh, I am going to give this charity to someone, you know, to this, to Fluffy the Cat, right? We accumulated virtue, but that was still under the control. We were still under the control of the disturbing thought obscurations. So we got a good rebirth, but it's still in some sign. Hmm? And... Therefore, we still have to experience suffering endlessly as long as we haven't abandoned the causes of samsara. We haven't abandoned the disturbing thought obscurations. That's the fuel for samsara. Okay? So if we don't want samsara, what do we have to do? We have to abandon the causes of samsara. Therefore, please bless me to reflect well upon the way of circling in samsara. What is the way? Karma afflictions. Of those two, the primary one is the disturbing thought obscurations. And therefore, we have to continuously follow day and night the path of three types of precious trainings, which are the precious training of ethical discipline, meditation or concentration, and wisdom. Hmm? which is the principal method to be coming free from samsara. Why is that? Hi? Precious training? Yes, 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 yes. The three types of precious trainings are the, the precious training of ethical discipline, meditative concentration, and wisdom. Okay. Then the question is, and what all of you should be able to answer why is that the principal method of becoming free from samsara? Mm. That is true. But okay. It, whoa, 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 what? And you need that wisdom to come to the Okay, very nice. You're, 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 um, you're on the right path. You're very close. I mean, no, you're, you're right. I'm just going to elaborate. But rather than have, you know, everyone talk, I'm just going to do it. Right? I'm going to spoon feed you this time. Okay? We talked about this a little bit last night when we talked about the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, you heard of those? Four Noble Truths. Truth of suffering, truth of the cause of suffering, truth of the cessation of suffering, truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Okay? That was the first teaching of Buddha. Okay? But, if we we're saying that um, Samsara is the process of uncontrolled rebirth due to karma and afflictions. Therefore, we need to abandon the, uh, you know, Samsara, we need to abandon the cause of Samsara. Of the two causes, karma and afflictions, the primary one is afflictions. Of all the afflictions, the root 
is the misapprehension about how ourselves exist, how ourselves and other phenomena exist. Okay? We have, I mean, technical terminology, we have grasping to inherent existence. You want a Tibetan lesson? Dagzin Maripa. Yeah, I see your pen is moving. Dagzin Maripa. Seriously, not you. Some of you, you know. Anyway, it's okay. Dak Zin Marikpa. Dak is the self. Zin is to grasp. Marikpa is ignorance. So the ignorance that grasps onto the self. Okay? So the ignorance is a wrong, mistaken, distorted view. Okay? <clears throat> to uproot that distorted view, you need to cultivate the view of reality. Okay? So that's the wisdom. When we say the three higher trainings, the real antidote to samsara is the wisdom. Okay? But, it's not just, um, for example, uh, we say the mind grasping to inherent existence is the ignorance, right? So actually, things exist, but they don't inherently exist. So the lack of inherent existence, or the emptiness of inherent existence, is the ultimate view of reality. Okay? Are we liberated? Yes. <laughs> no! <laughs> no, we're not liberated. We can have the right words, Right? But that is not, is not enough. Don't jump the gun. Okay? I'm getting there. Okay? But, but let, me, let me go at my own pace. Okay? So we need, we need the, the wisdom that now, okay, now this is the three types of wisdom they say, right? There's the wisdom that arises from hearing, the wisdom that arises from contemplation, and then the wisdom that arises from meditation. Yeah? So when you come to teachings, you get the wisdom arising from hearing. You know? Then, that's not enough, right? You have to realize it for yourself. So you contemplate. What did that guy talk about? He's saying that the, the self doesn't exist inherently. What does that even mean? So we then analyze, you know, contemplate how the self exists, how it doesn't exist. You know? And then, when we get a kind of inferential, a kind of conceptual wisdom, we then have to meditate, you know, and let it sink in. And so what I was saying yesterday, we first have an a intellectual understanding, conceptual understanding. When we keep meditating, then it will turn into a direct realization, you know, Direct realization means just as I can see you now without having to, you know, rely on a, some kind of conceptual image, I can see you. Eventually, we're able to see ultimate reality directly. You understand? Just, just hold on. So that direct realization of emptiness, only that one, has the power to abandon the ignorance grasping to the self. And as we were saying yesterday, not just once, but continuing to meditate again and again on the ultimate view of reality, only then we'll be able to abandon the, yes, the ignorance, but also the seeds of ignorance, means the ability for them to arise and them to continue again. Okay? So therefore, the real wisdom is, is the mind directly realizing, uh, realizing the ultimate view of reality or shunyata, emptiness. But it needs to be conjoined with meditation that has the ability to focus single-pointedly on an object for as long as we want. You understand? So they liken it to, and this is just an example, 
but they liken it to wisdom being like an axe and concentration being the ability to hit the same part of the tree. You know? If we just, you know, are all over the place, we'll never cut down the tree. By the way, it's just an example. Please don't go down cutting trees. In fact, plant more. Okay? Right? Okay. So that, that's why then, this, the second of the three higher trainings, that of concentration, you know, that's why that is there. The ability to hit in the same place. The steadiness. The same part in the, in the tree, right? Mm. Okay. So now, before that, ethical discipline. Okay? So here there's, there's two things. In the text on Vinaya, okay, on the monastic discipline, it talks about, okay, in order to get perfect um, meditative concentration, okay, you sit down and actually, I don't know, does this happen to you? But um, if you've ever spent a lot of time in meditation, like meditating 12 hours a day, okay? They say what happens is you start to remember all the negative actions you've done. You know, all the, th all the ways you've harmed people, right? And you're not, you're not meditating on the object you should be meditating. Instead, all these memories of how you've harmed people come up. Now, that's an obstacle to meditation. So, if you have ethical discipline, no regrets, no remorse. And then when you sit down to meditate, you can get to it. So that's why, that's one sense where ethical discipline is the prerequisite. But the other one is, well, unfortunately, bad news. Most of you are not going to get liberation in this lifetime. Huh? You disagree? Yeah, I disagree. Huh? Most of you? I disagree. <laughs> of course. It's possible for all of you too. Right? But, um, when I ask, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm myself included, myself included, I don't think I'm going to get a little bit in this life, unfortunately. Because, you see, when I ask, oh, how, you know, how's your practice, yeah, how's your practice going, you know, then I always hear the same thing, oh, so busy, right? We're too busy to free ourselves from suffering forever, right? Too busy to attain nirvana, right? It's like what we have to do, our job interview, is more important than nirvana. It's more important than enlightenment, right? That's how we act. So when I ask people, then like, you know, I was saying this the other day, I don't know, maybe some months ago. Does anyone meditate for two hours a day? Three? Okay. So two hours a day, you get the gold star of CKSL. <laughs> Top meditator of CKSL. Right? Gold star, two hours a day. Okay? Two hours a day is the best we're doing for Nirvana. Now, your job, right? We're working eight, ten hours a day. You know, I met someone, they're like, okay, I'm doing the night shift. I work till 3.30 a.m. 
I'm sacrificing sleep for my salary. Right? So much hardship. Mm. Now, do we even, like, you know, we meditate it's before bed? You know, then we're thinking, okay, I'm going to keep pushing. I'm, I'm going to meditate till 3 a.m. for sentient beings, for enlightenment. Does it happen? No way. That's why I say most of us aren't going to get enlightened. Because we're not putting in the effort. Hell, either way. Is it safe? No, it's not the same. It's not the same. You, I say this story, um, I love it. But, uh, you know, our, our spiritual director, our Mahaguru, Lamzo Rinpoche, the Koban taught her at the Koban course, you know, comes on to the, to the teaching film, you know, meditates a little bit, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth, if you knew where you're going to be reborn in your next life, you wouldn't sleep. You understand? I love that. I don't practice like that. But that, that actually really encapsulates this initial attitude of a, a Dhamma practitioner. Right? Do you understand? No shot. Do you understand? So, sometimes I've, I've, I've asked you guys before, there's two senses that that statement can be interpreted, right? One, you understand? If you, if you knew, if you only knew where you were going to be reborn in your next step, you wouldn't sleep. Two ways they can be interpreted. What do you think? You can either be thinking, because you're going to be reborn in the lower realms, which is such a ter terrifying place that uh, you'd be so scared you couldn't sleep. Right? The second is because you see on your current trajectory you're going to be reborn in a state that's like so much suffering you would spend all your time day and night trying to purify your negative karma and accumulating virtue. Therefore, you wouldn't sleep. You'd be practicing Dharma all day. Hey. I'm not doing this for effect. I'm actually having a moment here. You know. Some years ago, I sometimes think this, you know, when I was first ordained, you know, it's like that honeymoon period. I felt like, you know, so motivated for practice, you know, practicing well, doing what I gotta do, doing my practice, have a lot of energy. And then, you know, uh, you know, it gets a bit honeymoon period's over. Maybe I'm getting older. The mind is getting, you know, tired. You know? <sighs> but some years ago, I was on a retreat. I really had this thought. Like this kind of... Wow. If I were to die today, I'd definitely be reborn in the world. I had that thought come up. It was really strong. And 
And then, you know, if you have that thought, then the energy for practice Unfortunately, most of us aren't going to be liberated in this life. And because of that, we'll need a succession of good rebirths, well, rebirths that we can practice Dharma. Right? And this human rebirth affords us the best opportunity to do that. If we're born as an animal, no way. You understand? So of course, we have as our ultimate goal, enlightenment. But since we see, we can't, we probably won't do it in this life. We need to then say, okay, therefore for me to get enlightened as quickly as possible, I need a succession of rebirths as a human, not just a human, but with enough intelligence, with enough resources, with access to the teachers, with access to the teachings, that I can, over the course of that many lifetimes, then achieve my final goal. You understand? So, even the Bodhisattvas, of course, higher level Bodhisattvas, they just want to get reborn wherever they'll be most beneficial. And there are situations where Bodhisattvas would get, choose to be reborn in the lower realms. But, for us, we're not Bodhisattvas, we then want to have the best conditions for practice. And now, see, the, the imprints, the habituation to the afflictions are very strong. And the habituation to wisdom, love, compassion, whatever, is very weak. So, even though we're aspiring to be bodhisattvas, you know, as we see in the King of Prayers, all this, right? We always want to have a precious human rebirth where we have access to Dharma teachings. So that is a kind of temporary goal that we have, that we must cultivate. Of course, that's still in the samsara. So we don't just say that's all we want. You understand? Okay, okay, okay. So you understand what I, I was, why I kind of launched into that? It's actually very, very informative if you're paying attention. This would be a very good question on a, like, exam, right? Why are the three types of precious trainings the principal method for becoming free from samsara? Answer that question. Yes. 
So if not, look over your notes, you know, read the authentic treatises, and I guess you could listen to this lecture again, but whatever. You know? Okay? This is, this is important, you know, to understand. This is what I was just talking to someone today about, you know, when we come into uh, learning about uh, Buddha Dharma, it's like we have to understand a whole kind of new vocabulary. You know, what is samsara, what is nirvana? You know? But then you should be able to also explain to others, why, do you, why are you going to that, that center? I want to become enlightened. What? What is enlightenment? Do we, can, can we define these terms? What is nirvana? Why do you meditate? Hmm? These are the things we're trying to learn. That's why, that's why the center is here. You know? Okay. <sighs> Independence upon that. I'm on now, I'm now on page. What do you have? Nine. It depends upon that, even if I achieve near liberation, since there is no sending beings of the six types who has not been my father and mother, please bless me to think I must fulfill their purpose and turn away from the lower happiness of nirvana. Then please bless me to generate the precious bodhicitta by equalizing and exchanging myself for others and to follow the conduct of the conqueror's sons, the six paramitas, and so forth. Okay. So here... And I'm sorry, sir, I... What's that on your shirt? Everest. Nepal. Please um, remind me your name. Vijay. Huh? Vijay. Vijay. Um, I'm so bad. My memory. Oh, by the way, Shanti, I have your pen still. And, hey. The cap is a little bit, it's a little bit loose, or did I break it? No, it's probably very old and doesn't work properly. <laughs> Good. I borrowed this pen, and then like, you know, normally you get a little click, right? There's no click, and it's like... It's my center notes pen, it's been going for years now. You see that? You see that? that was but it's a Schaeffer, Schaeffer pen, so it's not that bad. No, no, it's, it's, it, the writing is excellent. I'm talking about the, the action of the cap. No, Parker, sorry, Parker. Ah. DJ? One more time? Shagun. 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 Gun. G-U-N-H-A-G-U-N. Shagun. Chinu. And now you understand, I'm just writing it down, but I don't have any of your pictures, so let's see how how good this is. You Bhavna. Huh? Bhavna. Bhavna. Wow. Bhavana, that means meditation, right? Yeah. Oh. Bhavana. 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 Oh, Bhavana? Yeah. Okay. I thought meditation was something. It means going to Bhavana. Bhavana is, is, it, Bhavana is, is a thing. Emotion. Feeling. Or a, or emotion. The colloquial meaning is. Bhavana is meditation. Ah, Okay. Mm, okay, and I've just met you for the first time. You don't have to share your name, but if you do, yeah. Puna. Puna. Shupra. Shupra. What is a morning? Subha. Morning. Subha. 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 Okay, okay. Shupra. 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 B-H-R-A. Shubhra. 
And you married him back? Appa. 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 You have an Appa. And I have an Appa. Okay, the rest of you? I know. Oh, sorry, you, sir. What's your name? Uma. Uma. Oh. Uma. Uma. Now, you know, I have a like one in eight chance. I don't know if this is the face, so I just call you whatever. Okay. So what was I saying? Huh? Oh yes, yes, yes. VJ. Is that pronunciation good? VJ was saying he asked difference between Nirvana. And enlightenment, because I was saying, you guys aren't getting liberated. Means we, I'm also not in this life, right? So here we have the difference. In dependence upon that, even if I achieve mere liberation, okay? So we differentiate. Here, mere liberation is when it happens when we abandon the cause of samsara when we abandon the ignorance grasping to the self and it seeds you become liberated, that's what nirvana is okay? but the attainment of enlightenment is different enlightenment is you know, samyak sam buddha the complete completely perfected buddha who not only has abandoned the afflictions but has attained the state of omniscience which comes from also perfecting all the virtues, not just abandoning the afflictions. Okay? And therefore, well, see, follow the comics of the con follow the conduct of the conqueror's sons, the six paramitas, and so forth. Paramita means perfection, right? So that's the main training of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is someone who wishes to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. That mind of wishing to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings is the mind of Bodhicitta. And those are the principal uh, trainings of the great capable being, as we see here. So look, let's read that again. Independence upon that, independence upon that means what? Practicing the three higher trainings. If we practice the three higher trainings, we'll get in, we'll get liberated from samsara. But even if we do that, see, we're free from samsara. But there's no sinning being of the six types. And what are the six types? Six types of rebirth within samsara. We have the asuras, the suras, types of devas, right? Two types of devas, the humans, animals, preta, and narak. Okay? If you see in the back there, in the, the wheel of life, it's the six types of, of rebirth within samsara. Anyway, next to the, uh, to the left of the wind chime, you can, anyway. Sana wanted a teaching on that, right? She offered, she offered me a, a gold mandala. No, she didn't. <clears throat> anyway, I don't want a gold mandala. I have to be very careful. Okay, so that's samsara, six types of existence within samsara. Now, in the Buddhist cosmology, time is beginningless, the mind is beginningless, my number of rebirths are beginningless, and therefore, in this life, I've had a mother. In my previous life, I've had a mother. In that life, before that, I had a mother. Blum, you know, and going on. So then, every one of you have been my mother, my father, you know, 
everything, not just once, but many, many times. And therefore, in all the six realms of existence, you can't find even one sinning being that has not been our mother, father, loved one, you know, pet cat, many times. with so much kindness and, and uh, we're the source of all of our happiness and now we're in a state where we can do something really meaningful to repay that kindness you know we can liberate them from their suffering and they're in a really pitiful, hopeless state. They can't do it. You know? But we can. Why? Because we have this precious human rebirth. You know? This kind of body and mind, access to the Dharma teachings. We've discovered like a, a you know, a supreme elixir, as Shandy Deva talks about it. You know, an elixir yeah, we can, you know, that can turn iron into gold, right? So the mind, this mind of Bodhicitta can turn this body into the Buddha, you understand? So we must do it and turn away from the lower happiness of Nirvana, even if we just get, you know, just liberation for ourselves alone, it's actually not that big a deal. We're just one, and all sinning beings are countless. So we have to turn our minds away, you know? Just like if we, when we go from the, the non-Dharma practitioner to a Dharma practitioner, we turn our minds away from the happiness of this life to the happiness of future lives. Then in the middle scope, we turn our minds away from the happiness of future lives to the happiness of liberation, individual liberation. Then we turn our minds away from the mere liberation of nirvana to full enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings. How we do that then is to generate this precious bodhicitta, generate this wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings by equalizing and exchanging myself for others means to mm, in our current state we're so focused on our own happiness on what happens to me alone and maybe a few friends or loved ones you know, very small but most sentient beings doesn't matter you know it's not my problem Right? Mm. So that's what we have to equalize and exchange myself for others means the amount of concern we have for ourselves, we're just one. All sinning beings are countless. So we have to exchange this fundamental preoccupation with our own happiness with being that concerned about others' happiness, who are infinite in number. Okay? When we do that, then we see, in our current state, actually we're very limited in the amount of help we can be to others. Right? So, we now have to become... Oh! <laughs> we now have to increase our qualities to their highest extent and abandon all the faults of the mind, you know, which is the state of enlightenment. You know? Then and only then will we have the skills, the ability, 
power to help beings in the best way, to help them be free of suffering. And that mind, I must achieve enlightenment so I can be of utmost benefit of all sentient beings, is this mind of precious bodhicitta. But merely having the wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings isn't enough. We then have to actually engage in the conduct of the conqueror's sons. Conqueror is the Buddha. So in the Tibetan, it's Gyalase, right? The conqueror's sons. That's a bodhisattva. What do the bodhisattvas then do? They accumulate the causes for achieving enlightenment. That's the six paramitas. Six paramitas is eth uh, sorry, giving, ethical discipline, patience, enthusiastic perseverance, meditation, and wisdom. Okay? Yeah. So like that. That is the the uh, Kebu Chembo. Uh, the great capable being. Okay? Did I answer your question? See? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh. No, no, because sometimes, you know, when I'm in the middle of something, someone has a question. And so I say, not now, because most of the time, I'm about to answer the question. If you just give me my space. But I didn't, so now you can ask. You said that like, not all of them are your mothers from previous birth, mm. or this birth, or whatever relation. Yeah. Uh, you're working, as a Dharma practitioner, you're working towards uh, helping them free from suffering. Mm. And also, you, you develop the intention that you know, you're going to take a real birth in a higher realm, in the next birth. You'll be meditating on that and you'll be practicing in the current world, right? Okay, keep talking. So, uh, in a perspective of uh, human life, like yeah. being a Dharma practitioner in this world, so you, like you know you're practicing, right? Like whether it's a sports person or a, a monk or a Dharma practitioner or a layman, you're just practicing, right? Suddenly, uh, there are two uh, angles of questions in this. So it's, um, uh, you might uh, be dead, so then what happens? And is it this time? Is death is this time? Because you're a proper Dharma practitioner, you'll be practicing to, you know, uh, take a rebirth uh, in the next world. Accidentally you might uh, leave this world. <laughs> so then what would happen? Is it this time that we are going to stay? Or the Dharma practitioner will decide when he has to leave this world. Uh, Okay, you guys hear that? You're practicing Dharma, right? You're practicing Dharma even with Bodhicitta. Thank you. But then, do you have to die? Is that the question? And you when may, you die, you may die, or you know, like, uh, and do the Dharma practitioner choose when to okay. leave, or they can okay, stay okay. here until they reach their goal. Okay. So, the question you all heard because the question. Body is a tool, right? Yeah, 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 I'm with you. You understand the question? Does the Dharma practitioner do they decide then when they die, or do they, or what? Must they die? Or they would be focusing on... Uh, you can use a different word for death. There's so many other No, I like death. <laughs> Let's use the word death. Okay. Okay, so just since we're running out of time, the, the real answer is depends. It depends on the Dharma practitioner. Okay? So the best practitioner actually will could achieve enlightenment in this life before dying. Right? Okay? Then, even if you don't achieve enlightenment, if you get to a certain point where you have a direct, you have bodhicitta, and you have a direct realization of emptiness, you become a so-called Arya Bodhisattva, then they, they get the, the so-called uh, 
Chindu Kewanemba, right? So, like they think, like, like, like they wish, they take rebirth like they wish. So those ones can direct their rebirth. They can also, you know, choose to, you know, extend or not this life. They have uh, control over that. But the rest of us, you know, we're, we're still in samsara. So we have no control when we die. We have no control where we would be born after we die. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, wait, well, well, what do you think? What do you think? It's like it's like a retirement account. We get like certain karmic points and then when we have like, you know, a certain number, we're like, okay, I can retire and no longer practice Dharma. No way. You're not aware that you know when you're going to die. So just no, no, no. keep practicing. No, hey. Until we're enlightened, we have to keep practicing. So even these Arya Bodhisattvas who can direct their rebirth, they're practicing all the time. Because they have the motivation, I need to become enlightened for the benefit of all sinning beings. Every second that goes by when I'm not enlightened, but put it this way. After I become enlightened, I'll be able to liberate sending beings in the best way possible, right? But until that happens, I still have mistakes. I still won't be able to work for their benefit in the best way, right? So they're practicing day and night. You remember I was saying, even this, uh, the true uh, small scope practitioner, the, the, the true, uh, you know, kebu chungu, the, the, the true Dharma practitioner who's merely preoccupied with getting a good rebirth in the next life, Lama Zobar and Bishay is saying, they won't sleep. So of course, the one who's truly seeking liberation or the one truly seeking enlightenment would also be practicing day and night. No holiday from Dharma practice. They might still go to Goa. <laughs> But even their going to Goa would be for the benefit of all sending beings. I think Venerable Lexo is in. Yeah. You, Venerable Lexo is now in Goa. Right? He went there not to go to the beach, but to benefit sending beings. You understand? <coughs> so now my time is nearly up. But that's what I wanted to cover from this text. Okay? You understand? So now just a brief introduction to this text, the main thing that we're doing. Okay? Okay, so let's just let's just look. Huh? The last line on page uh, sorry, of that paragraph on page nine. To follow the conduct of the conqueror's sons. Okay? The conduct of the conqueror's sons is the activities of a bodhisattva that leads them to achieve enlightenment. Okay? So now, we have then this text, which is Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, which in a more literal translation is, okay, Janchi Senpe Chupala Jupa, right? So Janchi Sempa is a Bodhisattva, Chippa is conduct, Jupa is engaging, engaging in the Bodhisattva's conduct. So see, follow the conduct of the conqueror's sons. What is the conduct of the conqueror's sons? The six Paramitas. Yeah, which I, I, six perfections. So now this text, Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, or, or engaging in the Bodhisattva's deeds, then explicates in a more he say, expanded manner, those six paramitas. Okay? This one just says six paramitas. Okay? But 
how then one actually does that practice, that's talked about in this text. Okay? So this is the kind of, uh, you know, the guide to a Bodhisattva's way of life. Means, if you are a Bodhisattva, or even an aspiring Bodhisattva, and you wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, what do you do? How do you conduct yourself? How do you live your life? That's what this text is all about. Okay? So then, just, just to, to give a brief introduction, okay, this text is then uh, 10 chapters. The first chapter is about the benefits of bodhicitta. Right? Because unless we know about the benefits of something, you know, what's in it for me, then why would we put in all this work? Okay? So the first chapter is talking about all these benefits of bodhicitta. When you see the benefits, then you'll be like, okay, I'm going to practice that. Right? Hmm? Then, you see, in this text, where is it? Um, yeah, the, the third chapter, you have a full acceptance, they translate it, full acceptance of the awakening mind. Awakening mind is bodhicitta. And in that chapter, you actually develop the Bodhisattva vow. You vow until enlightenment, you're going to follow in the conduct of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the past. You know? But before you do that, before you make that commitment, you have to get rid of the discordant factors that would be contrary to Bodhicitta. And therefore, the second chapter is the disclosure of evil, they call it. The disclosure of wrongdoing. Where you look at your previous misconduct and you say, okay, I recognize those negative actions as negative, I'm not going to do that anymore. Abandon that. Then the next chapter you say, okay, and the, the virtuous conduct of Buddhism Bodhisattvas, I'm going to adopt that. Okay? Then the fourth chapter, conscientiousness, means, see, uh, well, uh, having firmly seized the awakening mind in this way, conquerors children must never waver, always should they exert themselves and never stray from their practice. Hello. No vacation to Goa. Always exerting themselves in the Bodhisattva deeds. Okay? That's the, the fourth chapter. The fifth chapter then is guarding alertness and just the first stanza of that. Those who wish to guard their practice should very attentively guard their minds. For those who do not guard their minds are unable to guard their practice. Right? You understand? So this is about then how we always are watching our minds, making sure that our minds are always in virtue, you know, cultivating virtue. Okay? So then the next chapter, chapter 6, is this chapter on patience. And that's where we are now. So...
So, every time I come and we do this text, it kind of turns out this way. That we have a Saturday night session, and then the Sunday morning session, right? But the Saturday evening session is just getting everyone up to speed. So, since there's some, you know, committed members who've been coming here for a while, I try to then mix it up a little bit, how we then review and get everyone up to speed. Right, Archana? Yeah. So today is a little bit different way of doing it. You know? So, huh? Thank you. Tell me more. <laughs> no. So, um, I was trying to actually finish this whole text yesterday. But uh, that was completely unrealistic. Okay? But we went through all of the, the entire path to enlightenment, actually. If you're paying attention, that's how you become enlightened. You know, this turning away from, from this life to next life to nirvana to enlightenment. That's the main... Uh, you know, training we do. We keep expanding our motivation, you know, to this ultimate motivation, bodhicitta. But then, even bodhicitta, as great as that is, isn't enough. We have to then actually do it. And then that's what this text is about. Okay? So we'll continue tomorrow, 10 o'clock a.m. Okay? It's not that early. Come on. It's not that early. Is it? No way. So, yeah, I hope to see you. You can bring a few of your friends if they're interested. Otherwise, um, I'll see you guys tomorrow, okay? So before we go, let's just do a, a quick dedication of the, the merit of the positive energy we've accumulated in our time here today. So due to this positive energy, due to this merit, may all sinning beings, vast as the vastness of space, quickly be free from all their suffering and attain the state of complete enlightenment as quickly as possible. Then we also dedicate for the long and healthy lives of the spiritual friends, particularly His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zobarimbashe, all of the uh, spiritual friends teaching the complete path to enlightenment. May they have long and stable lives and may all their holy wishes be accomplished immediately. Then we also dedicate for the uh, Chokor Samling, this center. May, uh, may it receive all the required conditions so that, such that it can be successful in its activities to benefit all sentient beings. And then all the people who come here, may they have the only the most conducive conditions for their practice and uh, be able to achieve enlightenment in this very lifetime. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, one small thing. Um, so the Venerable Kadro, I don't know if you know her, she was the spiritual program coordinator of Root Institute in Bodhgaya. Her sister uh, just had a miscarriage. So um, for uh, that baby, and then all the other sending beings who have died recently and are in the intermediate state, the bardo, may they uh, be reborn in a pure land of the Buddha, if they haven't uh, accumulated the causes to be reborn in the pure land, may they at least achieve a perfect human rebirth and meet with the Mahayana gurus and Mahayana teachings and quickly attain enlightenment on that basis. <laughs>